Uh, we're in our third part of uh, our August series on discipleship. Um, you may be asking why. Why are we spending uh, the month of August talking about discipleship? I've always loved the question why. I think it's a very important question. And we as a church have five core values. Five things that we say that everything in the church we must do, should do. Uh, we should live them out uh, every day of the week, every time that we come together. This is what should be our heartbeat. Worship, evangelism, fellowship, ministry, or some way call it service, and discipleship. Now, a lot of churches will put a focus on one of those five. I've just always believed that they're there for us to do all of them. But sometimes it's kind of like the, the whatever the top scoop is on the ice cream cone. Which one are we focusing on? What core is driving the bus? Some say it's worship. Have you ever heard somebody try to describe a church and they'll say, well, that church is good at whatever. Maybe they'll say it's worship. Uh, Mark led good singing this morning. I appreciate that. But worship is not something that you do for 30 minutes before the preacher preaches once a week. Worship is something we should do every day. It, it, it's a time of being with God and, and praising God and loving God and l letting the true being of who we are being poured out before Him. A matter of fact, what happens in in, when we come in this building is a reflection on how much the church has worshipped during the week. Some say it's evangelism. Let's just get everybody to heaven. Let me ask you a question. Are we getting everybody to heaven? Billy Graham. Y'all know who Billy Graham is? I think a generation may lose one of my heroes. But Billy Graham said from all of his crusade ministries that uh, the people that came forward, a lot of people that got saved were church members. He, he used certain figures, and I don't know if they're true or not. He said maybe possibly 75% of the church is lost. That's a scary fact. I don't want anybody to go to hell from the pews of New Holland Baptist Church, right? Let's take everybody to heaven. So I don't know. I do believe we should emphasize worship. I do believe we should emphasize evangelism. I also believe we should emphasize fellowship. And as we're going on through life, I think we should fellowship together. I think we should minister together. We should serve together. But I pray that we grow together. Grow together. My fear is that the Great Commission has become the Great Omission. I think if you look at Matthew 28, go and baptize. That's evangelism. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy, in the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. That's discipleship. But I believe that though evangelism and discipleship should be the beat of our heart, I think all of these things we should do. We are called to be followers of Christ. Our goal in life should be like Christ to act like Him, to do the things that He said, to not do the things that He told us not to do. I think that we should give ourselves to Him fully. <clears throat> Discipleship is more of a map, a journey, than it is a menu. If you come to church and you say, I believe I'll take a little bit of this and I, I'll have a little bit of this. Look, you don't come to God all our cart. You get it all. You may say, well, I, I, I'm just interested in this. <clears throat> it all flows from Him. So if you're only interested in part of it, you're only going to get part of Him. I think we need to open ourselves up totally and completely. Some say, let's just get them to Jesus, get them baptized, and get them to heaven. Baptism is not the finish line, it's the starting line. Discipleship is the journey along the way. Southern Baptist just completed 
a, a survey on discipleship. They took 20 years from 1996 to 2016, and they studied 20 years of Southern Baptist life. In 1996, not church members, the FBI can't find half of those. They show up on Christmas and Easter, maybe. But we had a line in our report where we would report our numbers for the year, and they would ask us, how many was your average attendance? And putting those numbers together, they said in 1996 that the average church attendance for a Sunday over the Southern Baptist Convention was 5,240,000. Pretty good number. Kind of sad when you think of 300 million people in America, but we'll take what we can get. Now, from 1996 to 2016, we baptized 7 million people. Pretty good number. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Tell the story of Jesus. Write on our heart every word. Some heard the gospel, repented of their sins, and gave their heart and life to Christ and became a follower of Christ. But in 2016, now remember in 1996, 5,240,000 people showed up on a Sunday, any given Sunday. In 2016, 5,200,000 people showed up for service. After baptizing 7 million people, we lost 40,000. Does that concern you? Is this something that God said was important? The Great Commission, go forward and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, the commandments of God, <clears throat> that we would know them, listen, and discipleship leads to obedience in our life. That's what we're headed towards, Christ-likeness. It's not how many lessons are being taught. Now, I, I am, I believe completely in God's ministry of preaching. I surrender myself to it. I seek to do it in honoring God's word and honoring his, honoring his presence and honoring his power and honoring his love. How shall we know unless we hear? But, but church, as we have put more focus on certain aspects of church life, others have fallen by the wayside. I cannot tell you how many pastors I've heard say that. Oh, we've had all these people come in. The front door is wide open. But then they'll make this remark. Maybe you've heard it too. But the back door seems to be open too. And they're just circling through. We have people that will come into the church and they'll be with us for a while and then we don't see them anymore. They just circulate around. Now, COVID is an aspect of our, our, our society and our nation in the last years and everybody has wanted the church to get back to where it was before. Let me tell you what's happening, not on one church, but in all churches. There, there are mostly the churches are smaller. We say smaller because the people who attend are attending less often. Before, your dedicated people were attending, I don't know where they get the statistics, they're smarter than me, 3.1 times a month. I don't know how you get a point one in there other than by averages, but now it's 1.7. So people are still coming. They just don't come as often as they did before. What happens when they don't come as often? 
they're receiving less. And it's very easy to kind of inch out. Y'all tracking with me? This is the reality of what we're doing. This is the reality of all the churches. Some churches are growing. <clears throat> but this is the, the statistic about that. The churches that are growing are the big churches who have all the programs, that's a key word, who have all the things that they're giving out. And what they're doing is they're taking the sheep out of the small churches and they're putting the sheep in the bigger churches because they offer more than the small churches can. And the consumer attender wants those things for themselves and for their children, for their family. So they're going to those churches. So there are churches that are growing as they are stealing the talent out of the small churches. And yet, I, I was talking with one of our church members. I don't blame them. They want to be fed. They want to grow in the likeness of Christ. But shouldn't it be that if you're a church of 50 or 100 or 200 or 400 or 800 or 8,000, no matter the church, people should be growing in Christ? Is it that the Holy Spirit, His power is limited when the numbers are limited? I don't think so. Maybe it's we're not emphasizing things. So we've taken this month to talk about it. We're going to give you an opportunity to maybe get in a disciple group. But before we talk more about it, let's honor God's Scripture today. So if you would, stand with me in honoring God's Word. Luke chapter 9. I'm going to read verse 51 because I think it sets the stage for what we're going to be sharing. Are y'all with me? Verse 51 says, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He would say his time is not yet. But now he understands that it's the last lap. Now he understands that he's going to Jerusalem where the mighty work of salvation will occur, the cross, the sacrifice, the serving us so that we could receive. So this was on his mind. This was on his thoughts. Now look down in verse 57 of the same chapter. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he, that is Jesus, said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Now, he didn't say no. He just said, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. I used to think that was mighty mean of Christ until I understood what he was saying. Verse 61. Another also said, Lord, I will follow you but let me go and bid them farewell who at fell where farewell I didn't say that very well did I who are at my house Jesus said to him no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back now this is powerful is fit for the kingdom of God let's go to the lord in prayer the Father, we love you. We want to honor you. We want to follow you. We want to do it right and well for your glory. But Lord, we also know there's great benefit for us, great joy for us, great peace. There's the abounding of your love. There's the fruit of the Spirit when we will 
humble ourselves before you. Father, you didn't say that you would humble us, but you encouraged us to humble ourselves, to take up our cross and follow you. Lord, teach us what you have in mind for us. Show us the map from where we are to where we need to be. May we grow in you. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would speak personally to us. For Lord, I think we need a personal invitation to discipleship as well. We need to make up our mind that for the this day and every day, for the rest of our days, we'll just draw as close as we can. What a joyful day that will be when we see you face to face. But Lord, I don't want us to miss the joy of being in your presence now. Lord, we've done it wrong many times. Teach us what it means when we do it right. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? In verse 57, someone came to him. Someone said, just volunteered. I, I, I guess that they had been with him for a while. Now he's turning and he's headed to Jerusalem. In the verses between uh, 51 and, and 57, he was going to a, to a Samaritan village and they got mad at him because he was going to Jerusalem. He wasn't staying there. They weren't getting what they wanted. They didn't understand the plans that Jesus had, the things that he needed to do. So they got mad at him because he didn't do things quite the way they wanted. But there was one who came to him and said, Lord, I'll follow you. Maybe he was like one of the 5,000 who got fed. You remember that group of 5,000 that were there? There was The Bible says 5,000 men, but there was also women and children there. Some scholars say 12, 15,000. Some say as many as 20,000 or more. That's a crowd of people. And, and they found Jesus in that place. And when he saw them, his heart had compassion for them. And he preached the Word of God to them. And then he took a little kid's lunch, a little sack lunch, and he blessed it and he broke it <clears throat> and he fed all until all had eaten enough. I know some of you don't think you ever eat enough. But, but they were full and there was leftovers. My wife would be happy because there was leftovers. And Lynn always wants to say, can I have a to-go thing because I got extra food here? And she wants to take it home. They took up 12 baskets full of leftovers of the fragments that remain. But it goes on to say in the Gospel of John that, that some were following him simply because of what they could get from him. After he fed the 5,000, he it said it was late and he left them. He put the disciples in a boat and, and he sent them up, uh, uh, across the Sea of Galilee. He went up on a mountain to pray. After he had prayed for them and he knew a storm was coming and he prayed for them, he walked on the water. He met them there. They had a God moment. And the next day they're on the seashore. And when the crowd heard that that's where they were, they're on the other side of the lake. The crowd who had been fed rushed toward him because they were looking for what they could receive from him again. Some now were even using the, the buzzword, could he be the Messiah? That, as in their mind, is this the political leader? Is this the one that's going to straighten Rome out? Is this the one that's going to elevate us? Is this the one that's going to straighten out the kingdom? But y'all know Jesus didn't come to reign yet. He came to serve and save first. By the way, he's still coming back. And when he comes back, he will rule and reign. And we'll be the beneficiaries of that. Maybe this guy was because of that. And he came and said, Lord, I'll follow you. But Jesus kind of knew his desires and his attitudes, and he says there, he said, 
Foxes have a place to live. Birds have a place to nest. But me, down here, I don't have a home. I'm a pilgrim traveling through. I'm a missionary on duty. On duty. I'm going to Jerusalem where I will stay in someone else's house. I don't even have a place to lay my head. I have come from the riches of glory, but I have emptied myself for your benefit. Maybe this man changed his tune about following Jesus when it wasn't all about what he could receive. There was another. Jesus said to him, follow me, two words. By the way, when the Holy Spirit shows up and the Holy Spirit shows you your need and the Holy Spirit says, we're separated because of your sin, but I'm willing to forgive your sin because I, I came to die for you. My blood was shed to cleanse you of your sins. And when that wooing of the Holy Spirit that convicts us of our sins and invites us to come into a saving relationship with Him, if we will say yes and say, I will give my life to you, not simply you give your life to me. You save me and I'll serve you. You give me your glory and I'll give you all the glory for all the things that you say and do in my life. You've blessed me and I'm grateful so my life is in service to you. Jesus simply said, if that's the case, follow me. Where I go, you go. What I do, you do. We're about the Father's business. So you pick up that mantle and you be about the Father's business as well. But he said, verse 60, or excuse me, verse 59, he said, well, Lord, it's almost like he's saying I would, but he says, let me first go and bury my father. Now, his dad didn't die a couple days before that. But his dad's gotten older, and he's basically saying, let me go home and take care of my family. Let me be there. It may be six months. It may be a year. It may be five years. You know, my dad's a tough old bird. It may be 20 years. But when, 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 when my duty's done, I'll come back and serve you. You know, there's a lot of excuses that people have for delaying their service. I wonder how many times I personally said not now when the Holy Spirit spoke. I think it's a good thing. Matter of fact, if you had asked me back then, should a person be saved? I would have said, yes, a person should be saved. But I, I didn't. And And... Church, there's a lot of things that I know in this book that I'm not living up to. And I may say, well, I need to, I should. One day, when are we ever going to find that day? Now, I'm not being mean. Is that not all of us? I think it's all of us. And matter of fact, when we say that, there's a little twinge of, I should do better. Would y'all agree? Another one said to him, oh, hold on, let me tell you what Jesus said to that guy first. He said, let the dead bury their own dead. There are things that are important, but there are greater priorities. I'll take care of those. You get about the Father's business. You know what I found when we walk with the Lord? There's always time to do both. Matter of fact, there's abundant blessings when we choose to do both. I built my dad a house. <clears throat> and by the way, it's still standing. 
You might not think so, but it's still standing. And then one of those scouting parties came and they found me. And I moved to Habersham County in 2002. And I left both of my brothers and my sister and my parents in Dalton. That didn't mean that they weren't part of my family. I just had something else I was supposed to do. And I, the church, when dad had a brain cancer and tumor in his brain, and my mom died of a stroke. Matter of fact, if mom had her way, she'd have gone 15 minutes before dad. If dad, but you know how that is. But God took care of it. The church was very gracious to me. They said, you go. If you need to go, you go. You take care of your family. But I don't think they ever got left in the lurch either. I think it was God in a win-win situation. Isn't it cool how God can give win-win situations? You don't have to lose in one area to gain in another when, you, when you're playing with God's economy. But there was a third one. He said, Lord, he said, I will follow you, but first let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. I, I need to say bye. Drawn between two worlds. Saw a guy one time trying to get out of one canoe and into another canoe. So he threw a foot over and he had one foot in one canoe and one foot in another canoe. That was called splash dance. How he thought that'd be a good idea, I don't know. Some people want to have one foot in heaven and one foot doing the things, the dance of this earth. And that's never a good dance. And it usually brings to bam, boom, and oh me. I think we need to understand that God says, put your sights on me and go forward. Jesus said to him there, he said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. I, I like to garden. Hadn't in the last four years. Some church called me and I came down here and we done a few things a little differently. Plus, we needed to eat all the stuff that we'd already canned. Amen. But I, I, I don't use mules and oxen. I got me a great big rototiller, and it's strong and it's good, and it cranks on the second pull every time. But when I first started to learn how to till, I was just a little kid, and it was a whole lot bigger than me. And now I, I don't like those that that take off and go. Y'all know what I'm talking about? The ones that you just hold on, and I like the ones that just do what you're supposed to do. You know, got the wheels in the front and the tails on the back. And but but I, I'm looking, and I got me a straight line there, and I get to the end of the line, and I look at it, and it looks like this. Can anybody give me a witness? <laughs> Amen. And, and dad would put a, a peg down on one side and a peg on the other side and a string between the two because he would just plow and it, his would look so straight. Of course, we can't do anything like our parents did. We have to do them better. And I was spotted out, not having another place there, just straight as a line, and I'd keep my eye on it and going. But, you know, sometimes something would happen, and I'd... Guess what? I mean, sometimes you put beans in those rows because beans grow like this and you can't see where they go. But it looks pretty pitiful. You can't look back. You got to look forward. You'll mess things up in a hurry. I think we've messed things up growing the church. I think we've think that discipleship is a just a choice on the a la carte menu we don't have to do those things maybe i might go to it i ask people all the time i say you want to come be in a small group maybe i'm thinking about it i'm praying over it i'm like who are you praying to because if you're praying to god he's gonna like it now 
Most of the time, people don't know what that means, but it means the people of God doing the things of God and we do life together. It solves not just one part of it, but it does many things together. Evangelism can happen while you're doing discipleship. Fellowship happens while you're doing discipleship. Service, doing things together, doing life, and, and ministering to other people, that happens Some people just think it's you have to go to a, a, a place where you sit around and somebody lectures them. No, that's, that's my job. You know, oh, that's boring. You know, I've done small groups. By the way, I'm much better at that than I am doing what I'm doing in here. And, and you get five guys together who don't ever talk. And you put them in a small group together and you can't shut them up. We do a little thing at the beginning of our small group. We call it catching up. I'm like, come on, guys, tie it up. We got the word of God we got to get to. And we do. And we do. Some say, oh, you're, you're trying to, to do away with Sunday school. You, that could not be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, all I'm wanting to do with Sunday school is make it better. Make it better. For years, they just say, well, it's Sunday school. They, they did all kinds of things. They had service projects. They had fellowships. But folks, I've seen Sunday school classes have one fellowship a year. That must be some more of a party because they get, they get the whole years done in one moment. I, we fellowship together. My group meets every two weeks. I'm about to start another group. We're going to... What I'm hoping is that we'll have more people who will say, I want some more of the fun and the blessing and the fruit of the blessings of God. I want to be in that group. My hope is that from September to December, that some people will get a taste of something that's fun so that when January comes, we'll get it cranking with even more people. I'm not trying to take anything away. I'm trying to add two. Think about this. Jesus spoke to the crowd. I just said 20,000 people at one time. The Sermon on the Mount. Man, that was a powerful message. The Sermon on the Low Place. But that was less than 1% of his time. He would go to synagogue. There may be 40, 50 people in there. How big was Jesus' church? One number says 70. One number says 120. Y'all okay with that? But even out of that, he called 12. And even out of that, he had the little, what I call the, the close encounters with three at a time. You mean we can do discipleship three at a time? Jesus did. I prefer five or six. I really prefer that they, if you had a Sunday school class, let me, Broadus teaches a Sunday school class, Phil teaches a Sunday school class, um, I teach a Sunday school class, um, Yvonne teaches a Sunday school class. I wish we had three times the Sunday school classes that we have right now. But you know, I've seen people be in the same Sunday school class for 40 years and the class never grew. But if they, inside, keep the class together. Don't stop it. Did, did y'all hear me? You don't stop that. But what if my group meets once every two weeks? What if you got people out of that group that would come together, that would share life together, that would look at a verse and discuss it together, that would do fellowship together, that would do, I mean, it, get transparent with each other, that would talk to other people, minister to each other, do it in a smaller group. It's fun. It's not boring. Uh, 
uh, Lance is in my group. Ben Waldrop's in my group. My son Jared is in my group, to my surprise. Kirby's in my group. Steve's in my group. Steve is now a yoke fellow here at New Holland. Jared has grown exponentially. I could not be more proud of my son. I have not pushed him. He is doing things all over this church. Mark is using him. Thank you, Mark. Mark is discipling him as well. Lance, blessings all over that man. He led uh, somebody to work two weeks ago. Uh, he led a, a co-worker to the Lord two weeks ago at Kubota. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. You baptized that boy yet? We're going to have to get that boy underneath. Like Jesus, he came as a man and came up out of the water. Immerse him in it. Ben Waldrop just had a daughter get saved. They teach Sunday school together, he and his wife. He is a walking witness for Jesus. You can't shut these people up. Look, when my group gets together, you know how much fun they have? I leave. I go home. Jared told me the other day that one night they stayed till 10.30. We started at 6.30. I'm like, go home. Valerie, I did. I told him, go home. Yeah, I'm sure he did. One night, they're not here today. They're over with Morgan, but uh, they were in Sunday school this morning. Uh, we, that group got to talking, and Kirby wasn't getting home. And I was on vacation. And Sheila started calling me, is Kirby okay? I said, I don't know. <laughs> There's something that happens with God's people and the Holy Spirit together when they can just love on each other. They don't judge each other. They encourage each other. They participate. I believe if I get six people together, you're not getting what the preacher knows. See, I believe the Holy Spirit that's in all six of them, they'll add to it. I went and played golf with Tim Ledford back there. And uh, it was hot, wasn't it? And we were both sweating, and he's had a heat stroke in his life. But two people sitting in a golf cart, I learned a whole lot about him. He just shared things, but people don't share and I didn't look any less at him. I looked greater at him. He is a better friend of mine because of it. If we didn't have that example, what would we do? My time is gone. My sermon's not over. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up next Sunday. Y'all don't have to see my great art that I drew for you this morning. You know, for years, Baptist... And that's us. We said we were successful by the three B's. Buildings, baptisms, and budgets. Lord help us. I don't think God judges us by the buildings, the baptisms, and how we're doing it, and the budgets. I don't think that's what makes us successful. I think what makes us successful is when we take the Word of God, we preach the Word of God, we read the Word of God, we memorize the Word of God, we talk about the Word of God that leads to obedience being applied in our life. That's the magic. Not just coming to hear me preach and walking out the door, getting your car and going home and you've clocked out for another week. We can do more. Churches were seen as, we, if we only had a program, you're putting your mindset on the program, then you are Christ. Southern Baptists were famous for programs. 
We can create a new thing and a new thing and a new thing. And you know what? We have to keep creating them because it's, it's always got to change. But the Word of God hasn't changed. I have read a ton of books on discipleship. But you know what? Those books are going to be forgotten in 50 years or 30 years. Some of them haven't. But I promise you this, this book will never be forgotten. This is where we need to head. This is where we need to go. I'm not trying to get you to join Brian's program. I, we seem to, if we could just get this building full, then we would be highly successful. Not if we don't shut the back door. In the very first church I pastored, I was young and green, and, but I had passion, and I worked hard, and I trusted the Lord, and in the first two and a half years I was there, we baptized more people than the 20 years before I came. I'm not saying that to brag. Hold on. When I left, there was a, an issue. It was in the church. And I didn't lead them, I left them. And by the way, I was right and they were wrong, and they've changed since then. But let me tell you what happened. I was wrong in leaving them rather than in helping them learn what God's Word had to say about it. It was racial. It was racial. And in the 18 months after I left, the church was not only back to where it was the day I went to that church, they were lower. And I'm not proud of that. Because if you build it right, praise be to the glory of God, and God will give the increase. If you build it on a personality, if you build it on a music program, if you build it on a, a, a different type of program, if we build it on something that looks like man, it will come and it will go. But if we build it on the solid rock of Christ, it will last forever. We've just taken the easy road. I wonder how many excuses are like the excuses we saw in Luke 9. That's all they are is excuses. They're not going to work when you stand before the Holy God. I think I said this to you. If I didn't, if I did, I apologize. Billy Graham said at the end of his life, what would you do differently? He said, I would pray more and I would be in the Scripture more. If that's good words, why don't we abide in that now? And why can't we do it together? You say, oh, I don't need other people's to come help me. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because you don't know what's going to happen. But when it happens, and by the way, it will, how blessed you'll be to have a group there to support you. Quickly support you. When Rick Warren, pastor at the largest church at that time in the Southern Baptist Convention, Saddleback Church, when he went to his son's house, the French doors looked through the glass and saw his son hanging there where he had killed himself through hanging. He didn't open the door. He called 911. He did all the things that he was supposed to do. He called his secretary. His secretary at church called his small group. And in a matter of less than 30 minutes, his entire small group was standing in the driveway with him. Is it because he's got a church that has 16,000 people show up on the weekends? No, it's because he's got a group of people that he prays with, studies the Word together with. They share life together. They're still part of the big, but they're also there in the small. If we can follow Jesus' example, we would follow the example of multiplication. 
Get small so you can grow big. 